This episode of Behind the Puck may contain material that would get you a game misconduct, so listener discretion is suggested. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a very special edition of the PVD cast. It's called Behind the Puck, Episode 1, and I am your host, John Orlando. The topic that we are going to focus on for this edition is a topic that happens to lots of NHL franchises throughout the season, trades and teammates. And to help us understand how important trades and new teammates are to an NHL franchise, Former Columbus Blue Jackets R.J. Umberger and Sean Pronger will chime in and help to add a little bit of explanation to the concept of trades. Of course, Brian Phillips, my partner in crime, will be joining me. And Steph Grieger stops by to talk about how trades and new teammates fit into the script for the third period. I would like to throw it out there real quickly. Um, a special thank you to Sean Pronger. As you'll hear, he called in because he's out on the West Coast, and I appreciate that he took some time out of his busy schedule, especially with the time differential, to sit down and chat with us. So without any further ado, let's get right on into it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to throw it to a quick break, and on the other side of the break, it's time for Episode 1 of Behind the Puck. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another installment of Behind the Puck. I am John Orlando, joined by Mr. Brian Phillips. How are you? Hi, John. I'm good. It's 95 degrees out. Let's talk about hockey. The The movie, The Third Period, is how we're trying to tie these podcasts together with the great sport of hockey. There's a, a plot turn in the movie without spoilers, and we'll talk about the movie with Steph a little bit later, see where that is. But there's a trade in the movie, and there's trades all the time in professional sports. And certainly this time of year, a lot of free agents are going from here to there. So we thought we'd have a, a, a couple of uh, former players on to address the topic of trades and switching teams and dealing with new teammates, new coaches, etc. We have a man that we just learned. Uh, can we talk about your uh, your your honor, R.J. Sure. Alberger? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Ohio State Buckeye legend will be inducted into the Ohio State Athletic Hall of Fame at a football weekend in September 6th and 7th, correct? That's correct. Wow. Do they, you get free tickets to the football game for this? Yeah, we do, actually. Wow. <laughs> we get a few. Awesome. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I got probably enough family coming in that I'll probably be buying a bunch, too. So it'll be a fun, fun weekend. I'm Did you know this was coming? Uh, I knew about a month before they announced it. Okay. Uh, I got a, a random phone call one morning and uh, got the news and... Um, I was pretty shocked, and uh, that morning just wasn't expecting that call, but it was uh, a fun call to have. Absolutely, and you're being inducted with uh, some other athletes of various sports at Ohio State. Can you can you name some of those? Yeah, there's ten of us uh, going in. A um, couple notables, uh, at least from when I was at school, was like AJ Hawk, uh, Mike Nugent. Wow, that's um, great. You know, basketball coach just uh, in the past year, Dad 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 Yeah, so. Um, Natalie Spooner, who was a great female hockey player, yeah. her as well. So, yeah, there's a whole bunch of, of great athletes, um, 10 of us all going in. And um, it should definitely be a fun weekend and a very honorable weekend. Absolutely. Well, RJ, uh, despite that you were only traded once in your career, correct? Um, actually, tw uh, twice. 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 No, okay. uh, three times if you really want to get technical. <laughs> so uh, once before I even started playing. Okay. But, uh, yeah, twice. Because you're drafted by the Canucks. Yeah, yeah. So twice uh, twice in my actual 12-year career. And uh, we thought, that's pretty good. But we ought to have a man on who was traded so many times that he wrote a book about being <laughs> traded and going from one team to another. Have a stick will travel all the way from uh, Los Angeles, California. Sean Pronger joins us, former Jacket. Uh, here, let me get out, get out my list here. Former Penguin, Ranger, King, Bruin, Blue Jacket, Canuck. Did I cover everything? You covered uh, the highlights, which I consider the NHL team. There's also a bunch in the minors, but I don't think we got time in the program for that. So, yeah, I think you hit them all. 
That's a separate program, Sean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, with with a, an important plot turn in the movie uh, about a trade, about a, a new player coming to a team that's uh, looking to win a championship, and having had that experience of being traded, um, is it is it ever a time where you're going? Thank God, I'm out of here. Did you ever feel that way? I can't say I can't say I ever felt thank God, but there was a time where I was a little bit excited when I did get traded, and it actually caught me off guard because I was in with Anaheim, which was I mean playing Anaheim was fun. The, the year prior, we had made the playoffs for the first time, so it was exciting. And then the following year, a major letdown. We had Paul Korea holding out for half the season, so we, the the season just just a wreck. I think we were dead last, and uh, I happened to be rooming with uh, Scott Young, who was about to be, he was a veteran player, had won a Stanley Cup, uh, about to become an unrestricted free agent. So that was my roommate on the road. So it was tra- trade deadline day, and, um, you know, we were expecting, you know, he, he's the perfect rental for a team that's going for a Stanley Cup. So the trend that we were in the room, kind of looking at each other, waiting for the phone to ring, and uh, I think we're in, yeah, we're in Chicago, and uh, the phone didn't ring. And I'm like, all right, Scotty, that's awesome. You get to stay for the rest of the year. And so I left and I went to the gym in Chicago. I get a phone call. at the, I get my name called over the pager. The <laughs> so, you know, Sean Pronger, please report to the front desk. So I go to the front desk and like, um, yeah, your roommate called. He wants you to call him. I'm like, oh, he must have got traded. So I call Scotty. Hey, buddy, where are you going? He's like, um, you better call the coach. I'm like, Okay. And I'm like naive. I didn't even think I got traded. So I call Pierre Paget was the coach. He didn't even have, he couldn't bring it upon himself to tell me. So he's like, Hey, have you talked to Jack Ferrara? I'm like, of course I haven't. So I call Jack Ferrara, Sean, we just traded you to the Pittsburgh Penguins. And so I'm like, well, I'm at the gym in Chicago, like just completely caught me off guard. But then I, for a moment, I'm like, Oh my God, they're in second place in the Eastern conference. I'm in the play. I'm back in the playoffs. This is great. And uh, yeah, I went to Pittsburgh and, um, Let's just say it did not work out that well. And uh, the next, I think the next training camp, I was sent to the minor. So I was excited for a minute when I realized I was back in the playoffs. And then, uh, you know, things changed real quick uh, around training camp time as well. So it was, it was unfortunate, although I was glad I got a chance to play in Pittsburgh for a bit. Well, Sean, can I ask a quick question about your experience in the minors? Are trades in the minors looked at with the same um, importance or levity or whatever word you want to use? as at the NHL label, at the NHL level? Well, here's the thing. Like if you're in the minors, for example, and you are on, if your affiliate team is not that good, usually it's bad. So if you're in the minors and you're like, let's just say whatever a crappy team it is, um, and, but they've got maybe one, you know, one a couple of veteran players on that team. What might happen is they trade the veteran player at the NHL level to a, maybe a team that's going to make it a run and they're going to get back a bunch of prospects, probably a couple of minor league prospects and maybe draft picks. So now your competition has just doubled at your position possibly. So it's not, so it does affect guys in the minors because you think, okay, well, this guy is going to be gone in the summer. That opens things up. And also they get an influx of like new blood. Um, so it can be challenging at times. The other, the other part is if you're on the other end of that, it's a good thing where you, you, you know, there's room created um, by guys leaving. And then as far as the minors, as far as your team, uh, some teams do, or at least back in the day, they would kind of get some, you know, um, try to get, get some experience as far as making a run for the, you know, the Calder Cup back uh, when I was playing. At least they did that. And nowadays, it's like, these are like 23-year-old kids, so there's not that many old guys left in the uh, in the minors. So the trade deadline came and went, and because of all the, however they got to do it with the league, it was like an hour and a half after the deadline had happened. And then, you know, they're trying to track, you know, obviously they call, to Page, get to my room, to the to, to, to the gym. I should, I should never have answered it. I wonder what would have happened if I just didn't answer. I, I love that you were traded and no one had a cell phone. So they had to page you. That's hilarious. RJ, I'm sure that, that you saw a lot of guys come and go in your career as any player would. And you don't have to name names, but can you think of a situation where a guy came in and you knew immediately that it just wasn't going to work, that this person was a disaster, that you wouldn't be able to get along with them, anything like that? 
Uh, not, not, not right away. Um, you know, all the, all the teams, uh, or maybe a guy had a reputation coming in and that, that you had heard he was this, that, or the other thing. Well, I think there's always, uh, trades that happen that, uh, you know, you come into a, a new team and you got to, the, the chemistry of the team is always, you know, in question, you know, how's, how's the trade gonna, gonna, you know, erupt the, the room and, um, that's the challenge that, that you have, especially the trade deadline when you, you add three, four, five different players. And, um, I, there, there was one particular trade. Um, you know, I, I don't want to mention the names, but, uh, in Columbus, we brought a big player in and, you know, the, the player just didn't want to be, be in Columbus. So, um, can I know, guess? I, I, mean, yeah, I, I can, I can certainly guess. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, and that next season, uh, you know, we, we got off to a bad start and it, it, it messed, the, messed the room up and it messed that whole season. So, you know, those are definitely things that you have to consider, you know, when the Jackets made uh, the trades this year that they made. Um, you know, I, I said it over before that, uh, you know, you brought four new faces in. Um, and, you know, not only is that four new players that got to learn the systems, learn a whole new culture, a uh, city, and they're going through all those experiences. Now you got uh, four other guys on a team that just are now are moving down on the depth chart or, or, or different spots, and they got to get adjusted. So you're really affecting, you know, in that, that regard, a third of your team. Mm-hmm. And so it was, you know, no, it wasn't, you know, surprising to me to see the Jackets struggle right away at first at the trade deadline. But then, um, you know, once they got it all figured out, obviously it, it was working out for them. Sean, what when you get traded? What is the first thing that you need to do when you get into a new room? Who do you go to? Who's the guy that you have to win over first? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I always, when I got traded, I always made sure I, I got like a, what are they called? A, a play, I got a player roster and get the bios of everybody. Inevitably, because I got moved around so much, I would have played with somebody that somebody was familiar with. So I would go to that guy and say, hey, I played with so-and-so uh, in Pittsburgh. Like, oh, he's a great guy. And that'd be like kind of an instant connection. So I'd kind of figure out who played where and if there's a way to do that. But mostly when you first get traded somewhere, you just kind of want to be quiet, take it all in. You don't want to be that guy that comes in like announcing his presence with authority. You just kind of want to kind of blend in, figure out the way things kind of operate in the room, see what the hierarchy is. I mean, you usually know before you're going in, but sometimes rooms are a little bit different. Um, you just don't want to be that guy that's trying too hard to fit in you just kind of want to let it happen naturally and if there's a way to connect with somebody with people that you've played with in the past um that's that's probably the best way rj you uh in a situation like this does a guy come in that that maybe you fought with or just he got under your skin in your playing career and now all of a sudden you have to try to get along with him as a teammate have you had that experience either one of you i'll just throw it open that that to me would be uh, potentially a, a minefield that you have to get past um, yeah, that definitely happens for sure. I'm trying to think of a actual situation where I, I experienced it. Um, nothing's coming top of my head, but that is definitely, um, you know, that's part of the game where, you know, your enemies, I mean, you're playing against these teams day in and day out all year. So you, you definitely develop enemies, um, guys you just hate to play against or, um, you know, maybe it's somebody you just played last game and then the next, next thing you know, <laughs> the next day they're either in your, uh, they're in your on your team, and I think that happened in uh, with Ottawa and in Columbus. I think Duchesne and Dzengel were on Ottawa one day, and then next game they were right. they were on Columbus and they were playing. So, yeah, that happens. Um, I'm sure uh, you know Sean Polly could experience that since he fought a lot more than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jet. Yeah, I think you're mistaking me. You're mistaking me for Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Sean, can I ask a question about the other side of the coin, so to speak, when you're talking about trades? Uh, RJ just talked about the professional side of things, but as you mentioned, um, you know, off air that you have uh, two children, and I imagine that professionally trades impact you a lot, in a lot more uh, impact, with a lot more impact, excuse me, than, say, on the professional side of things. Would you agree or disagree, or can you give us any uh, examples of how that impacted your family? Yeah, well, I mean, when, I, when I played, I didn't have any kids at the time, but I certainly had a girlfriend who's now my wife. And I give you an example of the of the first our first trade. So when I got traded from Anaheim, we were in Chicago on the road, and so I got traded from uh, Anaheim to Pittsburgh. I went immediately to Pittsburgh, and my uh, I think it might have been my fiance 
uh, at the time. She was in Anaheim. Now, when we were in Anaheim, this is like our first NHL experience. We've been there for about a year and a half, so things are pretty exciting. We're from small town Canada, so we are embracing the Southern California culture. We lived in uh, on uh, Newport Beach Peninsula. We were like literally 81 paces to the sand. 81, like heel toe, heel toe to the sand is where we're living in uh, in Newport Beach. And so I let her know, hey, got traded, Pittsburgh. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm going to go direct uh, and I'll let you know when to come. So whatever, it was like a week and a half went by and we were at home in Pittsburgh for a couple of days. So I had her fly out. And so <laughs> she came in, as I like to say, she came in under the cloak of darkness uh, into Pittsburgh. I pick her up. We go to, we're staying at the residence inn, uh, just actually outside of Pittsburgh. And so I get up in the morning and I go to, you know, she's sleeping. I go to practice. I come back. And it's a residence in with a kitchenette kind of thing. So she's at the kitchen sink for some reason. And I come barging in the door. I'm like, hey, how's it going? You know, silence. I'm like, hey, how's it going? And nothing back. And so then I, I kind of walk over to her and I like look around and she's like got tears coming down her face. And then I'm looking out the window that she's looking out of. And there's like a rusted out tractor in a field. And we're in the middle of the country in Pittsburgh. Now, and like two hours ago, she was looking at the ocean. And so like, and so in her mind, like, oh my God, what have I got myself into? So yes, it does affect families, sometimes a little bit different. I mean, if you got kids, it's awful because you got to figure, especially if they're older and you got schools to worry about. That's why guys kind of just go and, you know, their families will stay where they are and they'll kind of just make it work for the season. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I didn't have to drag kids around through all that stuff. Now I know why you live in California. You had to make some sort of deal with her, didn't you? Uh, yeah, well, exactly. We, I, I, I wish I could think that far ahead, but at the time I was taking it like literally month to month. Oh, that's, that sounds awful. Eight, you counted the paces to the beach. So I, I know you were down there a lot and to go to Pittsburgh. What month were you sent to Pittsburgh? Uh, I believe it was, uh, Mark, the deadline back then was oh. in March. Living in Columbus, Ohio, and you've been here as well. Cause you've been everywhere, man, as Johnny Cash would say, uh, the worst weather of the year is, in my opinion, March and April, because you expect it to be nicer, and it's not. And I, well, that's a testament to your relationship. There's no question. There's no bigger test than that. I think you would agree. Yeah. Well, I don't, again, I don't. If, if she, if, looking back, I'm not sure she would have signed up for that. But again, you, you always think the last, your last trade is going to be your last trade, and it never is. <laughs> so uh, I think if she, looking backwards, she might be like, you know what? I think I would have just uh, taken my exit uh, after the Anaheim trade. So one one question then I don't know RJ or Sean if you can answer this but as a as a fan I often wonder about trades and, and by that I mean we know that you hear the gossip that hey player X is done at the end of the year with their contract they're probably going to be traded and, and you expect that but there's always these oddball trades that I'm always wondering how do they get done like you have a fourth line center or third. Uh, third line right winger that gets traded before another one. And it, I just am curious, Do how do GMs come up with that idea of like, oh, hey, we got player B that's on our third line. We're going to trade him out to Arizona for one of their guys. Like, I've always bought, marveled about that. Do they hang around the water cooler and go, hey, Don, I got a guy for you? Well, I mean, sometimes they'll get calls from uh... – <laughs> Sometimes they'll get calls from you know different GMs at times. Say, hey, we, we have this player that we're looking, you know, who, who you guys got. So then you know they they create the idea, and you know once they get it in their head, they well, you know maybe he can make our team better. But you know they all have plans. They they have you know two, three, four year plans. You know they have uh, ideas that they want. Um, and you know roadmaps you kind of have to 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 keep a team going you know what prospects you have and, and whatnot and you know i think it's usually just sometime during the season your team is struggling and usually there you're looking to improve in, in a certain area and then you know you look at what assets you have what do you have that uh, you can give up and you know say maybe you got a couple guys that could play in the fourth line center so well we're going to offer a fourth line center <laughs> you know it also depends on what you're, you're you're trying to get back in return so um, again, you know, a lot of it's always, you know, you're trying to improve your team. So, you know, you have a certain need you need. You know, we need a left-handed winger. You know, someone shoots on the left side. We're, we're or a left-handed D-man, something like that. So they have a specific player they're, they're targeting. And, you know, they, they call the team up. The, you know, their scouts will give them a list. of Here's five, six different guys that we have to target. They'll call those teams. And to that GM, it's like, hey, we're looking for this guy. What do you need? 
Okay. You know, so and then and then you know it, it either works or it doesn't work, and if it doesn't, you move on to the next team. So um, you know, it's kind of just like uh, playing fantasy fantasy football or fantasy hockey. You just <laughs> start calling around, making moves. Well, what are you What are you gonna give me? So, yeah. <laughs> so I, I imagine though that sometimes it's just it's just finances. A team like Ottawa just would be looking at times to dump salary, not to not to single them out. Hey. Hey, Sean, what's the most insulting return in one of your trades, in your opinion, where you were just going, are you kidding me? Well, I can, I can, well, yeah, no, I was, I was traded and I, and this is, I was, I didn't even know I was traded. I never played a game for the organization, but I was the only, and I, the only way I knew I was traded was after the fact when my paycheck had the logo of my new team. What? I was, I was under contract with the Boston Bruins and I was playing uh, in Providence and they tr- I got my minor league rights traded from Providence to Winnipeg. So I was playing in Winnipeg and then uh, uh, the, the season ended. I went back to training camp in Boston, didn't, <laughs> shockingly didn't make it. And then I went back to Winnipeg. What I didn't know was Boston had too many contracts. They only allowed 50 back then. I don't know what it is now. Uh, 50 total contracts. So they needed to like get rid of me basically. And so they traded me or my NHL rights to the to New York Islanders for for nothing, basically. I think they just took me. So I think to answer your question, the most insulting is to be traded for nothing, which I was. But they didn't even have the courtesy. Neither team had the courtesy to tell me. So I am. I remember this like it was yesterday. I was in the grocery store. I picked up my check on the way out of the rink in, in Winnipeg, and I was going to the grocery store to get something. And I was waiting in line. I just happened to open my check, and I'm like. Why is there an Islander logo? So I called my agent. I'm like, hey, what's going on? And so he had to call Boston to find out what, what was going on. So yeah, that was probably the most insulting uh, trade that I've heard of, actually. Do you have any friends that can top that one, Sean? Or is that pretty much? Uh, I, don't, I, don't uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if it's possible. Like, you have to be, I mean, you'd have to give up. I guess maybe, um, like, in, I, I may be reading this wrong, didn't? Toronto have to give a first rounder and Pat Marlowe to the Carolina Hurricanes to take them. Wasn't that what happened? Yeah. yeah. Right? For the salary, cap, you know, so they could buy them out, whatever. I mean, that's even that's not that bad. I mean, it's. Well, at least he knew about it. But... You'd have to pay and get, like, I'd have to take money out of my pocket to pay somebody to trade for me. <laughs> that would be, that'd be the only way it'd be worse. I love it that you're at. What grocery store were you at in Winnipeg? Uh, I believe it was a Safeway. Oh, they have Safeway up there. So you're standing in the line at Safeway. You know, you're sent to to the store. It's probably minus forty outside to get milk, and you're probably like, I could use a six pack of beer right now, six pack of Labatt's or something. And you're standing in line, and you're piecing this together. And it's got to be like, I, I don't understand that at all. A lot of times, it was just more like, you know, I'm I'm a t- I'm a big kid. You can't hurt my feelings, but I mean, just. Somebody tell me. Well, yeah, it's common. It's common courtesy. It's common courtesy. That's Sean. We will uh, we will uh, leave it at that with you. We really enjoyed the discussion. We know you have to get going to the beach, right? Uh, yes, of course. I got to get back to my spot at the beach. I had to give it up. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks for having me on, guys. Well, you earned it, man. You earned that slot in the beach. You enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good one, guys. Sean Pronger who's I have to go back through the list again. And there was like, I was going through his, his page. There were minor league teams that I had never heard of on that list. So I figured he was pretty much an authority on that. You have to have a sense of humor though, don't you? Yeah, I definitely do. Uh, when you've been around that many d- different teams, you kind of just got to go with it, I guess, and just be happy you're playing. He definitely has a sense of humor about it. And that's, that's a good, but uh, check out HockeyDB.com. That's a good okay. source. That's the source that... Uh, so they have accurate information. Yeah, it's just... It's their base out of stats. But, you know, as soon as a guy, like he was talking about, a guy gets traded or you get traded, you know, you're clicking up uh, HockeyDB, right? Dot com and, well, that's where he should have looked to oh. find out who was signing his paychecks. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. I don't know. If they had to call him a paycheck <laughs> at the gym, <laughs> that's this true. might have been pre-internet. I that's, mean, I'm not calling true. him old because, you know, I'm not that type of guy. But yeah, I mean, that was Patrick Sean Paul. Well, RJ, you and Sean are consultants on the movie, and there's a trade in the movie. You know, Steph is here. Steph Grieger, the, the writer, producer, director of the film. What sort of uh, thoughts beyond what we've already discussed did you tell her about the the phenomenon of, uh, of a trade and how that works on a personal level when you're trying to tell a story 
anything else that you can think of, or do you think we pretty much covered it? I think we, we covered it mostly. You know, it, it, trades, uh, the big thing about trades is how it's going to impact the team. And, um, you know, obviously in the movie, it, it, there's a huge impact. Mm-hmm. It, uh, you know, there's a conflict that arises between a couple different two different players with the trade. So, um, you know, I think that's very realistic. I think, um, you know, in, in any sport, I think when, when trade comes, a person comes in, you know, it's, it's new, it's a new person that you have to com- compete against for starting time or, or, or whatnot. And, um, and that's real life. I mean, it's everybody's job and they're trying to earn money. So yeah, you want to win and you want to be, a, you know, a team and everything, but it's, it's sorting those things out, the dynamics of it. You know, how are you going to get along? How are you all going to fit together? You know, how are you going to still, you know, be the best person you can be, the best player? So, um, seeing how all those things sort each other out, uh, for a team being like the GM or, or someone that's up top that makes them is, is probably a pretty interesting thing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Sometimes it's a guy who doesn't want to be where he was just sent. You're still not going to reveal it. I know who it is. <laughs> I know who it is. But we'll talk about that later. I don't want to. I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Steph is here. Steph, we are talking about the movie. Where are we with the third period right now? Um, so we're in the middle of. I think we talked about this. Um, the last time that I was with you, John, we were talking mm-hmm. about it, um, is we're, we're still in the development phase right now. And that can take months to years mm-hmm. um, because you're raising the money essentially at this point. So we have a good film package. Um, we have a lot of good people that are part of the project, good actors that are signed on. And now it's just working on the different financing sources, the different um, producers who can sort of assist with celebrity talent. And we all know that we we do have a couple of really solid actors um, who are looking at the script, who are interested in it, which is great. So we do have um, the celebrity interest, which is wonderful. And now it's a matter of getting the the financing for it. Mm -hmm. And I think what we were talking about, too, beforehand is if it comes down to it, and I know some films do this, you can film on a rolling basis. So Mm -hmm. we may just start filming, start filming a scene or two scenes or three scenes at a time um, and just starting to put those together and um, and we're able to do that because there's some family scenes that we can do pretty early on. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some hockey scenes we could do with backup players. Um, and um, so there are things that we could do in the interim and start putting that together. And then we have a proof of concept. Then that's something that we can take to financiers and say, well, we're already this far along. Would you you know fund the rest of it? Um, and there's a couple of leads we have for a couple of guys, um, especially ones in the hockey world that, that might be interested in looking at that too. So... It's still moving along, still um, have interest in it, still, still, still going, but it takes, it takes a while. You have patience that I, I don't think I've ever (laughs) seen before. I I wouldn't be able to do it. I just, I don't have the patience and there are so many moving parts. That's, I think why I gravitated toward radio because it's just simpler and I I just don't, I, I admire your patience so much. And that's, has there ever been a time in the last several months where you're just like, that's it. I quit. <laughs> Ever? Uh, no, I, I don't. Good. I I have hit points of real frustration um, where it's just like, I, I think the point of frustration is that um, you have to have one to get the other. Right. So you have to have a celebrity to get financing, but the money you, can, to get you have the to get the money to get the celebrity. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of a, that's a, that's nothing new to film and producing. It's just, you have to find the way to get over that hump. Um, and so... I, I feel fairly tenacious. I feel like it's a good project. Mm-hmm. I feel like we have really good people associated with it. And, um, and I love the sport. And I don't think that there are enough good films out there about hockey that um, warrant stopping. So if I ever thought I should stop because it's not a great project, I would stop. But I, I just don't. I, I believe in it. I think it's a great project. Um, I believe in the people working on it and I just love the sport so much and just want to pay attention to it in a way that I don't think film has. I Mm -hmm. just, you know, you have a few of those good movies out there. Miracle, of course, everybody knows Miracle. Well, he likes a movie where there's a sword fight with hockey. He does. Youngblood. Youngblood. Oh, God. That was was 35 years ago almost. That sword fight scene is the greatest scene. (laughs) Is there a sword (laughs) fight scene in in the third period? There is not a sword fight scene. Uh, That's been done. Have you thought thought about about putting one in? I feel like RJ put it into my mind and now I'm seriously Mm. contemplating Uh, it. We can do it. But in all seriousness, 
seriousness, like uh, in all seriousness, you did just get back some script feedback, right? You want well, to talk about that real quick? So when um, I heard Sean Pronger talking about how when you first come into a room, you can't like dominate the room. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting. I was telling you like, oh my God, I got that same feedback from Dan Hynote. So Hynote, of course, was a coach at the Columbus Blue Jackets. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's Stanley Cup champ and um, one with Colorado and now he um, coaches at um, USA Hockey and uh, we were good friends and um, I asked him if he would come on and help consult on the script which he did and that was actually some of the feedback he gave on the script because obviously I am not I'm not a man I don't play NHL hockey so I'm not going to know the culture and the things that happen so I asked him to read it ask RJ to take a look at it and ask Sean to look at it um, so that they could look at it and go, mm, culturally, maybe this isn't the right fit. But when Dan read it the first time, I had hit the character was a little more like forceful when he came into the scene. And <laughs> Dan's feedback was like, he wouldn't really do that. He would be a lot more like wait, watch and see before he would you know, really get in there. So I took that feedback and sort of um, redid his entrance into the locker room to really sort of tame that down. Um, well, sure, that would be the majority of all trade in sports. Trade. Yeah. But rarely will you have a superstar, because there aren't that many superstars mm-hmm. changing teams. They would switch teams more as a free agent in the offseason. Mm-hmm. So that that makes sense to me that you can't come in, you know, with guns blazing. That That's the, the worst <laughs> thing. Do you ever see a guy do that, RJ? <laughs> No, not really. Uh, yeah, it definitely wouldn't be the best recipe no. for uh, success. Um, you know, I think it's important. To, uh, I mean, you're you're going to war every day with with those guys in that locker room, so it's important to to come into a team and you know build a, a relationship with them and you know kind of just get your feet wet first and you know be, become a team and and just respect all of them. They're the one they've been there every day, fighting in and out and. Uh, now you're, you're joining them. So you just got to kind of go with the attitude to, you know, I'm just going to help out in any way I can. You got to leave the superstar attitude kind of behind. Well, Steph is in there every day fighting the good fight too. And just keep us updated on what's going on. And the first scene you could shoot was the scene that we volunteered for, Beer Drinkers the 4 beer drinkers and 5, five. Yes. at yes. the bar Extra. watching yes. a game. Yeah. You can knock that one out. <laughs> We're so good. And you can I knock think it that would be one out in 20 minutes. relatively cheap to film. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I you, don't... Just, you just set a couple of pictures in front of us, and I mean, that's yeah. that's what, 10 bucks? Yeah, that'll take care <laughs> that's of it. it. There you it. go. Yeah. Work cheap. Absolutely. Done. Done. Check it off it's not the like list. we're Hall of Famers. We're, we'll, we'll work cheap. <laughs> RJ, again, congratulations on your honor. We really look forward to that first weekend in September uh, at Ohio Stadium as you are inaugurated into the Ohio State Athletic Hall of Fame. Thank do you, you. Did they give you like a big medal to wear? Or? <laughs> I, I don't know what they do. I, I know, all I know, uh, they do do a painting. Um, I got uh, oh, nice. I got contacted by the, the guy that's been doing the paintings forever. And what color eye color did I have back then? Like my they've changed and <laughs> you know and, and that's hair color. Crazy. Well, I am grayer now, but so <laughs> is it I, kind of like the like when you see like the presidential portraits? Or like yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I not think sure. it's an action photo, but I'm not, oh, okay. I'm not positive. Okay. And maybe it's like a little. Oh, bit you don't have to I, sit it. I ha- no. I this vision of you no. sitting in a chair for 10 hours. No, I think, he's, he's being <laughs> I think they take it from something of when you played. That so makes I, sense. I don't know what to expect. So I'm looking forward to that. It should oh, be a uh, fun little thing to add to my, uh, to my house. But um, overall, it's just going to be uh, quite a weekend. Um, very, very honored and a lot of great athletes, like I said. And if you look at the list of uh, the people that are on there, it's pretty uh, – <laughs> makes you shake your head it's pretty pretty amazing some of the guys that uh, have been inducted so do you find that your wife and kids are impressed with your accomplishments and if not do you think this will push it over the top because i know a lot with wives they're like yeah whatever you know yeah (laughs) my wife i think uh we've known each other for since we were in high school okay uh, so one of the things i kind of admired about her was it kind of the hockey stuff never really mattered so we were friends first, and, and that was always important. But she, you know what? I, I of all the things that have happened and everything, she, you know, was always kind of, you know, happy for me and whatnot. And you know, people would say something to her, and she'd be like, "Yeah, okay, so yeah." But I, I think, uh, you know, I remember she did send me a text when I got in, and how you know it was a big deal, and she was proud of me, and it was like, you know, one of the you know times that it, like she was actually pretty impressed about it. So that was pretty cool. And my kids. Uh, <laughs> You know, they were kind of young when I played, so uh, you know, one of the regrets I have, and you know, just 
your body gets older and you can't do anything about it, but is that my kids didn't see me play a little bit longer, especially my son. Uh, my, my, my oldest daughter kind of remembers, but, um, you know, like I got to show them YouTube stuff. Sure. And, you got to break you know, that yeah, stuff yeah. out so of the I, flat I, screen. I, I do that. And, uh, but, but I, you know, we, my, my wife asked me, like, are we going to bring the kids to it, to the game or, you know, to the, to the halftime show or whatever. And, you know, they, they should see, you know, kind of something that you've done. And I'm like, yeah, sure, sure. We'll bring them. Well, I found out my oldest, so- my oldest daughter made a travel soccer team. She has a tournament in Niagara Falls that weekend. So oh. she won't be coming. <laughs> Man, but, now, uh, now you're, you're speaking yeah. my language so, now. Yeah. To work around all those tournaments. Yeah. But I, I think to them, I'm just dad. And that's, well, that's, you know, that's the most important yeah. job. Yeah. If you're good at that job, everything else yeah. is great. Well, yeah. we're proud of you. Thank we'll be you. cheering. Appreciate it. Yes. Congratulations, RJ Umber. And thank you for coming on, RJ. Oh, absolutely. And, and definitely, you know, in the next few weeks and months that we continue to roll out episodes of Be Behind the Puck, Sean will be back joining us. RJ is going to be back joining us as well, folks. So never, never, never miss an episode. Yes, Brian. So I, I saw in an email from Steph that we're going to talk to Jody Shelley uh, for the next episode. So yes. I imagine we're, we're going to be talking about scoring. Um, I think so. Um, gentlemanly play. I okay. believe that is, you know, that is maybe definitely... maybe if we have time, we'll ask him about fighting. Maybe, possibly. Yeah. We, we should if probably we ask fit him it about in. fighting a little bit, shouldn't we, RJ? Uh, All right, we'll talk yeah, about fighting. That's what we want to talk about with Jody <laughs> Shelley. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, we, we've got a, a date planned, but when we get it done, we'll push it out into the world. There you as go. We are this one. All right, All right. are we done? I believe that we are done. All right. Well, All right. thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks to Sean Pronger. <laughs> thanks to RJ Umberger, to Steph Grieger, to John Orlando. I'm Brian Phillips. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Behind the Puck, Episode 1, talking about trades and teammates. I hope that you enjoyed it. I would like to thank one more time R.J. Umberger, Sean Pronger, Brian Phillips, and Steph Grieger for joining me on this very special episode of the PVD cast. want to let you know where you can get in touch with me if maybe you had some questions about the episode or whatnot. You can email me at johnorlando at pvdcast.com. You can find me on Twitter, and my personal Twitter is at pvdmvp. You can even go over to the Facebook page of the PVD cast. That being, of course, facebook.com slash PVD cast. And you can leave a message over there if you like as well. And ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. No matter where you're listening, whether it's at pvdcast.com, the online home of yours truly, or if it's iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, no matter what platform you're using, just make sure that you rate, review, and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And let everybody know that you enjoy the special editions of the PVD cast called Behind the Puck. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to get on out of here. I thank you for listening, and I will chat at each and every one of you later. (laughs) 